Hello, everybody. Welcome to Words Aloud 2016. I'm Terry Burns. Yes, you can, you can whistle. <laughs> I'm Terry Burns, the Artistic Director of the 2016 Festival, and I'll be acting as your host for this evening's performance, which is the first of several satellite events at this year's Words Aloud Spoken Word Festival. Before we go much further, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which consists of the Saugeen Ojibwe First Nation and the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. And now to tonight's program. <laughs> A few years ago, Hazel Smith Leiter, she's going back to her birth name, in case you're confused about that, Hazel Smith, became acquainted with Michael Crummy when she did an intensive workshop out east. Based on her glowing report, as well as Michael's outstanding body of work, we have been pestering him ever since. <laughs> this, this year, since he was already booked to appear at the Wild Riders Festival in Waterloo this weekend, he graciously agreed to fly out a day early and spend an evening with us. Tonight we'll listen to Michael read for a while and then we'll have the chance to ask him some questions about his work. Michael Crummy was born in Buckins, Buckins, a mining town in the interior of Newfoundland, which he says is as far from the salt water as you can get and still be in Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs> the second of four boys, he grew up there and in Wabash, Labrador, another mining town near the Quebec border. After completing a BA in English at Memorial University in St. John's, he moved to Kingston, Ontario to pursue graduate work but decided the PhD was not for him. For about six months, he taught ESL in China. In 1986, Michael won the Gregory J. Power Poetry Contest at Memorial. The $500 award gave him the mistaken impression there was money to be made. In, <laughs> in 1994, he won the inaugural Bronwyn Wallace Award for Poetry, and his first book of poems was published two years later. The recently released Little Dogs, from which he will be reading tonight, a mix of new and previously published work is his fifth book of poetry, the other four being Under the Keel, Hard Light, Salvage, and Arguments with Gravity. In addition to his poetry, Michael has also written four novels, which some of you may have heard of. <laughs> um, the Wreckage, River Thieves, Galore, and Sweetland. He's published a non-fiction work with photographer Greg Locke called Newfoundland, Journey into a Lost Nation, and a collection of short stories called Flesh and Blood. His awards are too many to list here, but among them he's been a finalist for the Governor General's Award, the Scotiabank Giller Prize, and the International Impact Dublin Award, and has won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best Book, the Writers' Trust of Canada Timothy Finley Award, and the Canadian Authors' Association Fiction Award. And right now, I am delighted to welcome Michael Crummy to us. Persistent, <laughs> uh, and to the folks at Coffin Ridge for putting this on tonight. Um, it's one of the real, uh, there is no money in poetry. Uh, I discovered to my horror. Um, but uh, I have, uh, I started writing when I was 17 and with, with no real expectations, but I've constantly been surprised uh, and uh, amazed by the invitations that I've gotten over the years to like just out of the blue to would you come and do something for us uh, and that has always felt like a real privilege of, of the job that I have. Um, I mean some of the invitations that I've gotten of course have been stranger than others. <laughs> uh, I, a number of years ago I got an email uh, from someone I'd never heard of asking if I would be interested in coming to Japan to give a talk on the Irish influence on Newfoundland literature. 
I have no idea how they found me. I have no idea why they thought I would have anything to say on the subject. <laughs> what I know about the Irish influence on Newfoundland literature amounts to what we would refer to at home as sweet fuck all. <laughs> but there was no way I was skipping a free trip to <laughs> I stood up in front of a room of Japanese scholars of Irish literature. <laughs> and I made shit up, my friends. <laughs> I thought, how are they gonna know? <laughs> they won't know. <laughs> if I had it in me uh, to be honest about what I knew about the Irish influence on Newfoundland literature at the time, my talk might have gone a little something like this. This is called The Selective. On a short haul flight to Boston with the selected Paul Durkin, Irish lines conjuring the Catholic girl who taught me to neck, her mouth a marriage of cigarettes and Wrigley spearmint, my hands two raw cadets assigned their permanent station, the blue denim circling those extravagant hips. And younger, Stocking minnows in a pond set among spruce trees beside the Catholic manse. The handsome father who played tennis in white shoes, who flew his own plane, and eventually renounced the priesthood for a woman. All the way to Logan International, the twinge of something left behind at the airport in Halifax while waiting for my connection. A loss I can't coax clear of faint apprehension. The stewardess leans in to offer a tray of snacks, a small silver crucifix tick-tocking below her perfect smile, one immaculate hand marred by the fleck of a gold wedding band. <laughs> um, so I am going to be reading uh, from uh, Little Dogs tonight. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. I know that... Um, Poetry is not everybody's cup of tea. Okay? I remember uh, about a year after my first novel came out, my mother went to, to a dentist in St. John's, a new dentist to her. And she got called in and sat in the chair, and the dentist said, well, Maisie Crummy, Maisie Crummy. He said, do you know this writer, Michael Crummy? And she said, well, that's, that's my son. And he said, now you tell him. <laughs> He's got a fan. And I'm going to read whatever he writes from now on. And Mom said, well, she's got a book of poetry coming out in about a month. And the dentist said, accept the poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read everything he writes except the poetry. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a shot at this this evening. Hopefully it'll go OK. <coughs> Any dentists? <laughs> um, as Terry mentioned, I was born in a little mining town in central Newfoundland, Buckins. It's pretty much the geographical center of the island. And it's uh, at the end of 70 kilometers of dead-end highway. And there is nothing else in there. 99.9% um, .9 of the communities in Newfoundland are on the coast because of the fish. And this community exists in the middle of wilderness, like hundreds and hundreds of miles of, of woods and barrens and bog surrounding us. Basically, you stepped out your door and you were in the woods. And uh, as a kid, of course, uh, I grew up surrounded by this unbelievably beautiful uh, wilderness that was right in front of me. And the place that my friends and I loved to spend most of our time was at the town dump. <laughs> <laughs> this is called The Eternal. It was where ugly thrived. Light and galloping stench prospered there in exile. The spent and defective arrived in the bed of a flagging half-ton on a strict bi-weekly schedule. A way station between town and abiding absence. A parcel of magic and ruin we haunted all summer. Casting through that wild acre of refuse in our young skin, gleaming like crows. <laughs> 
We trawled hours through those reeking ponds of junk where the rarest prize, porno mags or pocket knives, could fairly make me sing. Rats and the eternal stink kept everyone but us well clear. It was the only place in our lives I felt like a king. Um, when I was about 10 years old, so this would have been mid-70s, uh, a circus came to town. You can imagine what kind of circus came to a dying mining town at the end of 70 kilometers of Dead End Road in central Newfoundland in the mid-1970s. But we all went because they came. And also because uh, one of the stars of the show was uh, one of the wonders of the animal kingdom. This is called Tusk. They gimped into town driving geriatric trucks, circled their rinky-dink convoy on the softball field's faded diamond, a duct-taped carnival of slapstick clowns, a clutch of dismal animal acts. They were a grim crowd, setting up in the next dog-eared company hole down a dead-end road, barking at the little fucks who descended to gawk inside their mobile homes to watch them unload then stake and pole a withered circus tent. I nosed out the main event before the show began, a small, squat elephant, chained in a makeshift stall behind a trailer, the behemoth no taller than myself at ten. Wary, intelligent eyes above a single rail, the absurdly deft, prehensile trunk climbing shyly in my direction, it took all my metal to meet the gesture halfway, to bare hand that whiskered husk, so alien and animate, my arm reared back like I'd been shot. It was missing one stubby yellow tusk, a sad asymmetry that each day afterward, I somehow felt was more and more my fault. Um, my wife is a wildlife biologist, a bird biologist, bird biologist specifically. She has a fan in the audience. Um, and if you knew her, you'd all be fans. Um, and uh, she has spent uh, much of her adult working life on uh, tiny bird islands off the coast of Newfoundland and off the coast of Labrador. Uh, and these are basically just rocks in the middle of the Atlantic, and they're bird uh, nesting grounds because there are no predators that can get to them. So it's a safe place for the birds to come and lay their eggs before they head back out to sea for the winter. Uh, and uh, through Holly I heard a story about uh, a bird colony on the Funk Islands. The Funks are 50 nautical miles northeast of Fogo Island, which is itself fairly far out into the North Atlantic. So it's basically the middle of the ocean. And uh, Holly was the person who told me the story about a fox that somehow made its way to the Funk Islands. They assume it came down on pack ice from Labrador, but they don't really know. Um, and the, the island, of course, is covered by tens of thousands of nesting pairs of seabirds. And the, the fox was causing havoc, <laughs> as you might imagine. And the biologists had to decide what, if anything, they were going to do about this animal. And they decided that they would just leave things as they were, and that over the winter, once all the birds had left, that nature would take care of things. But when they came back the following spring, the fox was there waiting for them. <laughs> so uh, this, is a, this is a piece about that fox, which I have titled imaginatively, Fox on the Funk Islands. <laughs> I should be more famous than I am, I think. <laughs> Why am I not making money on this stuff? <laughs> Sorry. This is a serious piece. Serious piece. She drifted down from the strait on an ice pan and played havoc with the breeding season. The only predator within 50 miles. Wandering the well-stocked aisles, 
chasing seabirds off their roosts for the tasty morsel of fresh eggs, gorging on the delicacy, and she killed a freezer load of adults as well, caching the carcasses she was too full to eat, an ancient northern instinct, a store against the meager months of winter. We gave her no chance on the funks after the colony migrated, thinking once snow settled in on that deserted ground, she would starve to death or drown in the bottomless cold. Too rich an appetite for an economy so strict. But she was waiting for us in June, having survived the winter dark alone, making a long celebratory meal of anything she could chase down and kill. The returning birds unsettled, too skittish to lay or tend their chicks in the nest, and all summer we set traps, hoping to take her alive. Each time she stole the bait, leaving some small gift in trade, a razor bill's head, a puffin's wing, laid beside the trigger inside the useless device as a thank you or a taunt. And once or twice a week, she hung near the camp to watch us her stare calm and intently curious. We were an inconsequential riddle on the margins of her concern, an idle interest indulged at her leisure. And what she made of us being there preoccupied our talk as we picked away at the summer's banding survey, imagining ourselves in her predicament, anomalous and intransigent, wild and sovereign, hopelessly astray, and we admired the creature, grudgingly. Shot her our last week out there before the boat arrived, and we each laid a hand to the ratty coat as if to apologize for the necessary offense, a gesture of awkward, amoral reverence. Uh, and change gears a little bit. Uh, this is, I'll read something uh, from an older book of mine. Um, I wrote a, a book that was published uh, back in 98, I think it was, called Hard Light, which is mostly about my dad's life growing up in, in Outport, Newfoundland in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, and his involvement in the Labrador fishery from the time he was, he, he started fishing uh, with his father when he was nine years old. Although he says he had it easy for the first two years. He didn't take on a full share of the crew until he was 11. So, so I, it was a world so unlike the world that I grew up in that I've always been fascinated by. And one of the things uh, I did when I was uh, working on that book was uh, I tried to write something about my grandparents who were more or less strangers to me. My grandfather died when my father was only 16. And my grandmother died when I was five or six years old. And I don't really have any memories of her. So I, I knew three factual things about my grandparents. My grandfather was 20 years older than my grandmother. He'd been married once before, and his first wife had died. And their first child together was a boy who died about a week after he was born. So I took those three facts, and I spun a story around them to try and explain my, my grandparents to myself. And this is called Bread. That's told in my grandmother's voice. I was 20 years younger than my husband, his first wife dead in childbirth. I agreed to marry him because he was a good fisherman, because he had his own house, and he was willing to take in my mother and father when the time came. It was a practical decision, and he wasn't expecting more than that. Two people should never say the word love before they've eaten a sack of flour together, he told me. The night we married, I hiked my nightdress around my thighs and shut my eyes so tight I saw stars. Afterwards, I went outside and I was sick, throwing up over the fence. He came out the door behind me and put his hand to the small of my back. It happens your first time, he said. It'll get better. I got pregnant right away, and then he left for the Labrador. I dug the garden, watched my belly swell like a seed in water. Baked bread, bottled baked apples for the winter store, cut the meadow grass for hay. After a month alone, I even started to miss him a little. The baby came early, a few weeks after my husband arrived home in September. 
We had the minister up to the house for the baptism the next day, Angus McLean, we named him. And we buried him in the graveyard in the burnt woods a week later. I remember he started crying at the table the morning of the funeral, and I held his face against my belly until he stopped, his head in my hands about the size of the child before it was born. I don't know why sharing a grief will make you love someone. I was pregnant again by November. I baked a loaf of bread and brought it to the table, still steaming from the oven, set it on his plate hole and stood there looking at him. That's the last of that bag of flour, I told him. And he smiled at me and didn't say anything for a minute. I'll pick up another today, he said finally. And that's how we left it for a while. Um, so my father, as I said, uh, started working uh, very young. He's, he always said he never had a childhood. And uh, he, his father died when he was 16. He quit school at that point, which he hated anyway, to take over the family fishery. Found himself $200 in debt after two seasons, and was lucky enough to get a job working in the mills in, in Buckets. And he went there intending to work long enough to pay off his debt and go back to fishing, but the life was too good to give up. You know, it was heated buildings and flush toilets and a paycheck every two weeks regardless of the weather. So he stayed until the mine actually shut down 30 years later. And my impression of my father was that he was one of the most contented people I've ever encountered. He just seemed completely satisfied with the life that he had found himself in, with the work that he had, with the family that he has. Um, he, uh, when he uh, worked the, the day shift, eight to four, as a younger man especially, uh, we would usually have supper five or 5.30, which was just enough time for him and a few of the boys from his shift to deep by the union hall and have a drink after work. But he was never late for supper. He always came home to have supper with us. Except for one occasion in which he was actually carried in by one of his shift mates. <laughs> loaded drunk and bawling uncontrollably. And the guy just sort of threw him in a chair and then left. And uh, he was in the middle of what we call a crying jam. Like he was bawling so uncontrollably that he couldn't speak. And my mother couldn't get him to say what was wrong. And uh, she eventually just threw him in the car and drove out to Red Indian Lake and just sat there for hours until he cried himself out. And uh, he was never able to explain what the problem was. He was never, I don't think he even understood what he was crying about. And I've always thought as an adult that uh, it was probably just one of those moments of existential angst. Well, I'm sure my father would not have used those words. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have always wanted to write something about that. And uh, I, managed, I managed to get something on paper for, for the new and selected. So this is that piece. This is called Crying Jack. The weeks he worked at the mill, 8 to 4, Dad deeped home by way of the union hall to stand his shift around in the lull before supper. Hustling cross town to preside over grace, doling out our daily bread with a little glow on, a devil's smile, sneaking morsels from everyone's meal while our heads were turned, making off-color proposals to our mother that we were too young to grasp in their purient detail, <laughs> though the gist came through in her dismissal. Saucy, fondly annoyed. They both seemed more or less content with their lot, I'd have said, if a mirrored smile is any measure. Only once was he laid through the door, crutched in on a shift mate's staggered feet, dumped and steadied in his waiting seat where he bawled and listed hard to one side, while the sun stared and the half-eaten food on our plates went cold. We were terrified to see him so undone he couldn't speak. Unable to pry his eyes from the floor, even as mom tried to coax him back to sense, to all he asked of pleasure, the kitchen's fare, his young wife, fatherhood. <laughs> 
It seemed more than alcohol that crippled the man, some omen of teeming failure, and nothing he owned could staunch the flood that swarmed through and made him look a stranger, foundering in front of his own flesh and blood. It was a mother's instinct to protect her kids that placed us under a neighbor's care while she poured her husband into the car. Drove the blacktop to a gravel detour, rattled through woods above Red Indian Lake, and they spent most of the evening there, watching the water strobing whitecaps, the sight like static on a radio's wave, almost a comfort, a murmuring solve, as they waited for the jag's ragged kick to break, for fatigue to shut off the taps. There was no row, no needling the laps, as if my mother somehow understood, it was just the void peeking through a tear in the day's fabric that ailed her passenger. The stone stare of all we stand to lose while our heads are turned. That dark lull we disregard, though the gist bends in our hearts like a seed and blooms on occasion in bald detail. My brothers and I were already sound by the time they idled back to town, rattled and wrung out, but undamaged. Nothing was the same except what mattered. They had a life to be lived. They managed. How's everybody doing? Yeah. I got two more? Yeah. Can you two more? Is that okay for time? Oh, absolutely. All right. Um, this is a this is a piece I wrote for my wife when we got married uh, ten years ago, um, and of course uh, I wrote it. It was meant as something I was giving her on the day we got married. It was meant as a a, a gesture of uh, undying love and affection, and it's it's mostly about dad dying of cancer. <laughs> <laughs> which some people would say is typical of me. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, she said yes, <laughs> regardless. Uh, and this is called Something New. When test results confirmed what we feared, Dad was moved to the terminal ward. And my mother rarely left his side, all day to help him to and from his bed, to wash and feed him, rub his calves and feet. And she stayed there half the nights as well wouldn't give in to sleep, sat up in a chair so she could keep tabs on any sound or motion from her husband lying across the room. Her nights at home, I stayed with Dad. But once he'd taken his evening meds, I slept through till morning, unless he called. Weeks into that shift work, before he told me the sleeping pills leached clear of his system in the loneliest hours, and he lay quiet at three and four, so as not to disturb his company, dead to the world on a cot near the floor. I could never match Mom's fidelity to the vigil, admired it from a distance that seemed a lack in me, a resistance I've always felt to risking love, the cut of it that goes hand in glove with tying yourself to something as frail as another person. Bound to fail was my thought, and I always managed to keep well clear but my parents' marriage in its final days on the cancer ward made me think I'd live my life a coward. Not the most romantic lines to preface a wedding declaration. But I don't know how else to name the place I started from, to frame how new this is, believing we're equal to what the world might offer or steal from us in the time we're given. We're not young enough to ask for heaven on earth, but here's a promise I will make, to stay by you, to be fully awake. And uh, I'll finish up with this one, which hopefully will be a little bit lighter. Um, and I'll dedicate this one to everyone in the room who is now, or has ever been, in a partnership with kids in the house. <laughs> this is called getting the marriage into bed. 
Unplug the insatiable telephone, the apocalypse unfolding hourly on the network news crawl. Ignore the kitchen's Victorian factory of filthy dishes, the laundry pile suffocating a lost child in the basement. <laughs> Ignore the lost children. <laughs> Forget music and saffron and oysters. Put aside the cliché, the quaint rituals of wine and lingerie. Aphrodisiacs are for amateurs with more time than common sense. We've yet to learn that bliss is stolen from the world in small, piercing slivers. Think of stealth as foreplay in the prison yard of daily events. <laughs> Sneak out of your clothes as soon as the coast is clear. The air raid siren of a youngster crying is about to rise through the bedroom floor. The weight of the Three Gorges Reservoir has altered the planet's rotation by the same rate at which yesterday's dishes are going septic in the sink. <laughs> Be resolute. Bliss lives for bliss alone. Apply yourself to that ephemeral sliver. You have less time than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Stories are the building blocks of human thought. They are the way the brain organizes itself. If this is true, what happens when someone develops without stories? Is that part of the quote, or is that a question to me? Uh, do you agree? Do you agree with the statement, first of all, that, uh, that uh, stories have that role? I mean, that's certainly my experience of the world. Um, and it seems to be universal, like from from what I've seen of people and communities, that storytelling uh, is not just something to pass the time, right? That that in fact storytelling is what makes us human. I think that our understanding of who we are and our place in the world is an act of storytelling, uh, and that. Um, I think part of the reason we need storytellers and artists is because they are the people who end up telling us what our place in the world is, you know. Like when you, I did a lot of uh, Canadian lit studies before I dropped out of university. And one of the big things they talked about in that was how when Europeans first settled in Canada, um, the stories that they brought with them from the old countries didn't fit in. Right? The world was so different that those stories didn't really make sense. You know, like, uh, if you're going to wander lonely as a cloud in northern Canada, then you're going to die. <laughs> uh, and that the circumstances that people found themselves in required the creation of new stories, or the borrowing of stories that they weren't familiar with before they got here. And I think that's true at every level. I think that's true for people as, uh, as cultures, as large cultures. I think that's true for people as communities. That's true for families. And that's true for individuals. Like, we don't exist without storytelling. Storytelling is what we are. I mean, I, I, a lot of people go around trying to 
come up with something to say, this is what separates us from the animals, which I think is kind of a stupid undertaking. Um, but language was always one of the, there was the opposable thumb and then there was language, right? These were the two things that they used to say, and neither of which holds any water. But I, I think the biggest difference between people and other animals is storytelling, is this ability to create, to ask why and to create a story to try and answer that, that question. I have no idea if that has anything to do with what I'm doing. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> okay, so a lot of your work stems from stories you were told as a boy by your father and other relatives and members of the community. Are the stories still being told, or is there a fear that if they aren't recorded some way, they will disappear with the way of life? Um, well, I mean, when, when you ask, are the stories being told, still being told? I mean, stories are still being told in Newfoundland, for example. That's, I mean, that tradition goes on. But, but Newfoundland is different. So the stories that are being told are different stories. And I think it is true that if the stories that I heard growing up are not recorded in some way, that they will disappear. Because the circumstances that created those stories are disappearing. It's a bit what, uh, what you were just saying in the first question. That, that stories um, basically um, don't, are, aren't just autonomous things. They sure. exist within the context of the culture. Sure. I, I mean, stories, that's the purpose that stories serve, right? Which is to make a place for us in the world that we're living in. And if the world, if that world changes, then the stories have to change. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely felt uh, a sense of wanting to honor the world that my parents grew up in, which was completely different from the one that I grew up in. But also I had the sense that uh, if I didn't put those stories down on paper, then they were gone. You know? So uh, it's sort of a double-edged sword because in a way, the sense I had that I had to put that on paper was kind of like the last nail in the coffin of the oral culture that they came out of, right? Because my sense was that the oral culture was gone or disappearing, at least in that form. Right. And that's because the culture, the world of El Porto Flan had disappeared. Now I've always said that uh, my father were, I talk about my father in this more than my mother, he's 10 years older and, uh, and was involved in the labor <coughs> fishery um, from a very young age. So the world that he was born into had gone on in Newfoundland more or less unchanged for 300 years. And in the space of his lifetime, it disappeared completely. So I, I grew up watching my father watch it go, mm -hmm. you know? And I, that, I think, had a huge influence on me as a writer uh, in terms of what I'm interested in trying to do on the page. Mm -hmm. um, you comment uh, in the afterward uh, to the new edition of Hard Light, that you picked up the stories for that poetry collection around the cribbage table in the pool hall on a boat trip with your dad. Where and when did you originally hear those stories? Were there certain times of day or year or when storytelling more often took place? Certain places where stories were more likely to be told? Uh, I don't think I've ever considered that. Um, I mean, I, I feel, I mean, I had no notion that I wanted to be a writer until I was uh, uh, in my first year of university. But I, I, I feel like I was picking things up for years before that uh, without knowing why I was doing it. I mean, I remember hearing my dad tell a story when he was a boy fishing in, in Labrador. The, the real work of the season was during the capelin skull, when the capelin would be smelt that the cod feed on and they would come in to spawn on shore and the cod would come in close to shore after the capelin. And that made or broke your season. So that was a three week period where you didn't really sleep, maybe two hours a night, three hours a night. And I remember him telling somebody else, I was just, we were still in buckets, so I was probably 10, 11, 12. I remember him telling somebody the story about how when he would wake up after three hours of sleep, after working for 21 hours, his hands were so sore and stiff that he couldn't move them. And what he would do is piss on his hands 
that was the only sort of relief that he had to get them moving again. So I was 10 or 11 or 12 when I heard that, but when I started writing as a 17, 18, 19 year old, that story was there. Like that was something that I had, I had hung on to. And I feel like, I don't know where I heard that story. I remember it being told, but I don't know where. I mean, there, my father was a storyteller. So, uh, and especially if he'd had a few drinks, uh, he, the stories would start coming out. And he had a, he was one of these guys who had a repertoire, right? You could request particular stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell the one about your French book, or tell the one about the goat, or, and he would tell them, my father was not educated, like he dropped out of school, um, but he was a natural born storyteller. And uh, he wouldn't tell those stories word for word, of course, exactly, but he told them in exactly the same way, like in the same order. He had figured out how the story worked, all right? And Dad's stories were often funny, 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 and then there would be this dark turn at the end to give it a little bit of weight. <laughs> and um, I, I mean, I just grew up hearing those stories all the time. And when I was working on Hard Life, in particular, uh, I mean, I always say I wrote that book in order to steal my father's best stories. <laughs> But even when I was telling stories that I'd gotten from other places or stories that I was making up completely, it was that way of telling stories and his voice that I was, I was trying to mimic. It's kind of interesting because uh, you, you, you brought up something here. Um, you know, we think of storytellers and we think of it almost as a one-way street. But obviously, you know, you say your father had developed these stories and he knew his audience, right? Sure. So the storytelling, the, the, that storytelling is a relationship. It's not. It's it's the it's the listener and the teller. Yeah, yeah. I, when Hazel was in Newfoundland to do that writing uh, retreat with me, I remember talking. And I, it's something that I say whenever I do writing groups, which I don't do often. Um, but uh, I always say, you know, the work itself is the important thing and that you have to just concentrate on what you have control over, which is what you're putting on the page. And that that's the only reward you're gonna get as a writer. And, um, and someone in that group said, you know, if I felt like I was gonna do this writing and no one was gonna read it, then I would stop. And that really backed me up, and I thought, yeah, that's absolutely true. That 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 it, it's got to be a conversation. That if there isn't uh, an audience on the other side of it, even if it's an imaginary audience, even if you're writing for like a, somebody, a friend of yours who's died or something like that, if there isn't an ear on the other side of it, it's really, it, uh, it's not a living thing, you know? And the, the great, the thing I loved about the, the oral culture that I was part of growing up was how, how alive that felt. You know, that uh, to sit in a room with a, a bunch of adults, and of course I was a kid just sort of taking it all in, but to sit in a room with a bunch of adults where they just go around the room and everybody takes their turn telling these stories, and they're laughing their guts out, right? Or half crying because they're talking about somebody gone or whatever. Uh, it just felt like such a living, yeah, it felt like they were, completely alive in the moment that they were sh sharing, you know. And um, uh, writing for a living is a different thing. Um, but still, I, I, I love hearing from people who've read the books who are, who are still carrying those books in their heads because it makes me feel like there is a conversation happening out there in the world. And I've also learned to love these kinds of events, particularly because there's an ear on the other side of of what I'm doing, and that that is a really gratifying thing. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Um, um, your poetry um, is as strongly narrative as your prose, but more personal. Is it the autobiographical element that makes you choose a poetry idiom over that of prose? Mm -hmm. And in a related question, how much of your poetic eye is really you? Do you sometimes fictionalize your poetic narrator? 
Just trying to think about what's in the book <laughs> before I answer that. Um, uh, it is a there is a very marked split between the fiction and the poetry okay. for me, uh, and I don't know why that is. Um, uh, the the fiction that I've written, there's almost nothing of my life in it, and if there is anything of my life, it's just like a detail or something that fits the moment that that I'm writing. Um, but you know, a lot of the, I heard lots of stories that, saying that the, everybody's first novel is autobiographical. And uh, that's so not true of me. And it hasn't been true of any of the books, really. Um, but on the other side, everything I write in terms of poetry, just about, is autobiographical. It's personal. It's out of my daily life. It's about the people around me, about my family. And I don't know why that is. Uh, it was completely unintentional. And, uh, and uh, it might be good at this point in my life to try and mix it up a bit. So if I write another novel, I'm going to try and make it all about me. <laughs> and all the poetry from now on is going to be about other things. Okay. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. <laughs> we, we are taping that, right? <laughs> In some of your novels, going to the novels now, I find a tension between the fluency of the storytelling and the obvious debt you pay to that tradition and the culture, and the inarticulateness and taciturnity of many of the characters, their lack of access to their own motivations. You want to comment a little bit on that? No, I'd rather not. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, I mean, all I can do to speak to that, I think, is to talk about Newfoundland men. Uh, and, and that, again, this was completely unintentional and just me sort of describing the world that I know. Um, but it does seem that most of the men in the novels are, uh, are more or less incapable of expressing what they feel, uh, and often are more than that incapable, incapable of even uh, identifying what they feel. Um, you know, in the case of Moses Sweetland, he's somebody who feels things very intensely and acts on those feelings, um, but could not explain even to himself why he feels the way he does. And that is how I see a lot of the men that I grew up around as a boy, uh, in opposition to the women, who were uh, quite capable of talking about those sorts of things, and quite capable of uh, dealing with the world in, in those terms. So it's a very peculiar, Newfoundland's a very peculiar culture because it, um, it's very traditional in many ways. On the surface, uh, the man is the head of the household, um, and uh, you know my mother. I remember her saying to me when I was younger that she felt that a woman should follow a man in all things. But that is not how it goes down in the real world, <laughs> <laughs> and that is not how it went down in my house when I was growing up. Right, um, and I, I think that, and this is not true of all places in Newfoundland, obviously, but in many parts of Newfoundland, I feel like. Uh, the, these, are, these communities are closet matriarchs, yeah. Yeah. and that in fact it's the women who make the big decisions, right. uh, uh, and then uh, allow the men to make the public statement uh, on what decision has been taken. Um, and it does, it does feel to me that the world that men grew up in in Newfoundland did not allow them to develop that faculty, really, you know? I remember talking to my father when he was dying about uh, the, the time that he spent with his father. Um, 
because they, they fished together for years in Labrador. And that involved hours of just steaming out to the traps, you get the fish in, and then hours of steaming back to, to the rooms where you make the fish. And I said to him once, I said, you know, Dad, what would you guys, what you talk about all that time? And Dad said, well, you know, the weather, or <laughs> how the fish were running. Or... And as far as they were concerned, I think that was all there was to talk about, right? And that all the emotion, because clearly there was a lot of emotion there. Like, it's not like it's absent from their lives, but it all runs under the surface. Which in some ways makes it um, a pretty, an incredibly powerful force as well. Like something that's repressed that much is a pretty, can become a pretty uh, powerful thing. I remember uh, when, my when my older brother Paul had his first son, uh, my parents were talking to him, and um, as my dad was hanging up, I guess Paul had just had this son, and he was full of that emotion, and he said to Dad, I love you, Dad. Mm -hmm. And Dad was so shocked because Mom, of course, told us she loved us all the fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> But he had never said those words. And he was so shocked to hear it come out of his son's mouth that he said, yeah, okay, bye. <laughs> I'm not lying. <laughs> but then the next week, my brother Paul said it again. And I guess Dad had, had time to get ready for it. And he was able to say it back to him. And when I heard this, I thought, okay, fuck it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> And I was living in Ontario at the time, we would talk once a week. And I can remember that week leading up to that phone call. Like I would just break out in a sweat thinking <laughs> what I was gonna do. And, uh, and it took it took everything I had in me to say it to him. And uh, and then to hear it from him, you know, was, I mean this was something that uh, was one of the central parts of my emotional life, my entire life. And it's the first time it had ever been expressed in words. So, um, but I think for most Newfoundland men, that never happens. And maybe I'm overstating it to say most. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to typecast everybody. But I think for a lot of men, especially of the older generation, those kinds of emotions were never expressed or even acknowledged. Really, you know, like you, there were all kinds of couples who where the husband would never show the slightest bit of affection in public to the, to the woman that he was spending his entire life with. Um, but you know, they lived together for 40 or 50 years and there was clearly a, a, a real relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just not one that was expressed in the way that we would expect people to, to express it. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now and ask some questions. Uh, uh, questions from the floor? Anyone got a question? Mike, I'm really interested in the, did you accept the challenge of writing about the Atlantic Indians, Newfoundland and River Thieves? And I'm, I'm interested to, to uh, for you to talk a little bit about how Newfoundlanders look at that tradition. Um, there's a kind of disparate appreciation of First Nations across the country. They're kind of exalted on the West Coast because of their tremendous artistic achievements. The experience in the Midwest in this country is largely negative because of the extreme poverty. It's more neutral in Ontario. The kind of First Nations people are kind of below the radar, but you know they're kind of aware that we're not really. So what's the what's right. the perception? Of the, the, the question is about the Beothic Indians in Newfoundland. And, and about Newfoundlanders' relationship to, to that story and to indigenous peoples in general. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, the the Beothic Indians were the indigenous inhabitants of the island when Europeans first arrived. Um, and they became extinct or disappeared as a cultural group around 1830. The last known Beothic woman died in St. John's in 1832. I'm not sure if I got that year right. Um, and Newfoundlanders' relationship to that story is a very strange 
Um, I, I grew up in Buckins, which is five minutes from Red Indian Lake, which was the last safe haven for the last of the Beothic. Uh, and in a weird way, that story was all around me when I was growing up. You know, we had a cabin on the lake. Um, I used to go to the Shanaditi snack bar at the food center. Um, there was Beothic Motors in Grand Falls. And the story that I grew up with, and the story that I had in my head when I started writing that book was that the Beothic, at the time of first contact, were a huge group of people, somewhere around 50,000. Nobody knows now where that number came from. It was written down somewhere once and then repeated. And that they're extinct because they were hunted down and slaughtered like animals. That was the story we, we tell about ourselves. Um, that's almost completely false as far as I can tell. Um, the best guess that anthropologists and archaeologists can come up with is that at the time of first contact, the Beothic numbered somewhere between 500 and 5,000. So they couldn't possibly have been more than 5,000, couldn't possibly have been less than 500. But a, a very small group, a very insular group of people. Uh, and that uh, loss of territory, disease were the main issues. Um, we don't know why this is, but they wanted nothing to do with outsiders. So whenever Europeans settled somewhere, they would just withdraw. But because they were living on an island, they ran out of places to withdraw to. So most of the violence that there was any kind of corroboration for took place uh, on the northeast coast of Newfoundland, up around Twillingate, Fogo, those places, uh, when Europeans started damming the salmon <coughs> rivers there. And the Beothic had nowhere left to go, so their way of protesting that was to like cut the nets, burn the boats, and that sort of thing. And the Europeans responded with brutal violence at that point. Most of that violence was related to one family and their employees, the Pagans. So, uh, but by that point, there were probably less than 100 Beothic still alive, and they, they didn't last very long. So, Newfoundlanders have this bizarre guilt relationship to the story, right? What a terrible thing we did to these people uh, who were completely blameless and innocent. Um, and in some ways, I think that the numbers are partly an attempt to say how terrible this thing was that was done, right? It's sort of inflation to, uh, to say, how could we have done this? On the other hand, it's very easy to feel badly about that because there are no political consequences, right? There are no Beothic living in Newfoundland asking for land rights or saying that they have a claim to this place or anything like that. So Newfoundlanders are far more sympathetic to the Beothic than they are to say the Inu or the Inuit in Labrador or the small uh, communities of Mi'kmaq in Newfoundland. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's sort of where my take on, on that, that uh, Newfoundlanders almost have a proprietorial relationship to the story. Like, they feel like it's their duty to keep the memory of these people alive, almost. But at the same time, they don't work as hard uh, at the messier job of trying to uh, create a workable relationship with the indigenous people who are still present with us. When Newfoundland joined Canada in 1949, Joey Small had signed a piece of paper to say that there were no indigenous inhabitants in Newfoundland and Labrador. Just to get that off the books. Um, you know. So uh, we, have a, we have a long way to go. I mean, the, the Muskrat Falls protest that just happened, um, my sense was that most people in Newfoundland were actually incredibly sympathetic towards that and supported uh, that action. But I think that that's a new thing. Like I, I think that generally the relationship has not been great. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 Um, Michael, I was at Piper's Print at the same time, and one of the strong memories that I had was of the immense humor that pervaded that whole week with you and Lisa Moore in particular. And so I wasn't surprised to see that same blend of humor and um, heart 
and humility for today. But I'm wondering, is that just, you know, my luck encountering a few Newfoundlanders with that um, spirit, or is that a, a part of the Newfoundland culture? Um, I think it's part of the culture. Uh, I think that, uh, um, you know, when I was talking about my, my father and his friends sitting around talking, I mean, most of what they did was laugh. And really, they, people only had themselves for entertainment, you know, and that's, uh, and if, if you can't make people laugh, then you're, you're letting down the side, really. <laughs> and, uh, so to me, it just feels endemic to the place. Like it's just part of what you learn. Part of what you learn about how to relate to people is uh, trying to make people laugh or seeing the funny side of any situation you might find yourself in, regardless of how dark that is. Um, so yeah, I, I like to think anyway that that's that's part of who I am because that's part of the place I come from. Else? Uh, I want to know um, when you wrote the the ending of Sweet One, did okay. you have that? I, did, is that what <laughs> you thought it was going to be from the very beginning, right. or was that a process? Like, yeah. How? The, the question is about the ending of Sweet One and whether I knew that was going to be the end of the book when I started, <laughs> or if that was something that came through in the process of writing the book. Generally, with the novels, I have a pretty clear sense of what the ending is going to be before I start, just because uh, I don't know much else. So that is my way of uh, guiding the decisions that I make, is sort of like, am I, am I still pointing towards this end? Um, with Sweetland, though, when I started, uh, I didn't really know. Like, I had some vague ideas that I wasn't really convinced by. And I think I was probably halfway through the first half when it struck me. It was one of those moments where I was like, of course that has, that has to be the ending. And, it, and I mean in real detail, too, like in terms of exactly how that would unfold. Uh, and really, after that, the book was, it was the most uh, pleasant writing experience I've ever had. Like, every day was easy, it felt like because I knew exactly where I wanted to end up. So. Was there a question back there? Or? Yes. Um, I hope I didn't hear you correctly when you said, if I write another novel. I hope you didn't either. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, the Galore is a novel that opens with a whale beaching itself in this tiny community, and as they're butchering the whale, they, they find a, a human in the belly of the whale, who then sort of becomes one of the main characters of the book. And then after that, things get really crazy. Uh, <laughs> so the, the question of where did that come from? Um, uh, Galore, in many ways, felt like the book I was meant to write. Like when I was doing the research for that book, my idea was I wanted to get all of Newfoundland into one book. <laughs> and so what I did was I, I, I spent a lot of time at the archives, I spent a lot of time reading community histories, I spent a lot of time just talking to people. And I was collecting like hundreds and hundreds of what I thought were fantastic stories, anecdotes, characters. And I had some notion of how, like the story as it would unfold, like the, the two families and how it would go through the generations. But when it came down time to sit down and actually start writing, I just, I was blocked. I didn't know, I had no idea how to start that book. And I was sit, standing in my kitchen one day just pondering this question. And I started in my head singing this song we were forced to learn in school called Jack Was Every Inch of Sailor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a song that every Newfoundland kid was forced to learn in the 1970s. <laughs> it's about a whaler on the Labrador coast who gets swept overboard and gets swallowed by a whale. And of course that immediately made me think of 
the story of Jonah. And there were two streams that were going to run through this novel. One was the, the, the culture of Newfoundland, the, like this, uh, the stories and songs and superstitions of the place. And at the, on the other side was the, the Bible. Right? Because in Elkport, Newfoundland, those were the two things that told people what the world was. And so, all of a sudden, I had this story of a man being swallowed by a whale that touched both of those things. Right? There was the musical, cultural side and the biblical side. Side, and I thought, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to start with a guy being swallowed by a whale and popping out on the beach. And I knew nothing else besides that. But I thought, I just thought, I'm just going to go for it. So I had a lot of that first hundred pages was me trying to figure out who the hell this guy was and how he might fit into this story. So that's, that's where that came from. Thank you. Are we ready for cheese plates? Yes. All right. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up then. Um, everyone, please, round of applause.